to the beginning. Yeah. All good. We are also we're live on YouTube now. I will, uh, I will uh, share the prayers once we start. I just want to say uh, again a few words. Right. And if I, oh, if for me to see the prayer, um, I just undo the gallery thing, right? Uh, no, once I will uh, present it, it will show also on your screen. Okay. Um, I can also send the... Well, anyway, sure, we'll start with some breathing. So I guess if it takes a few moments to pose the, the prayers, no problem. Yeah. Also sending here the, the, the prayers booklet in the, uh, in the chat, if you want to download it uh, to the computer. Right. So I think we're good to good to go. We're good to go. Okay, great. Yeah. Eight o'clock. Okay, yeah. seven, eight o'clock. Yes, where you are. Great. Okay. Uh, well, shalom, everyone. Nice to see all of you. Um, I looked at all the pictures. Of course, I looked at some of your well, not all of them, but I flipped through them and I noticed a lot of you have beautiful dharma motifs in the back, lotus and and. Um, Tankas. Well, where I am right now, I don't have a tanka. I have a little altar, altar but I have this very special penguin <laughs> I wanted to introduce to you. Well, it's special because it was given to me by a very special person, by Kirti Tsenchevobuchi. But last time, it always sits there, but last time I put it away, well, every time I put it away, and then I realized, of course, Kirti Tsenchevobuchi is one of the main dharma teachers of israel so of course this penguin should be sitting there um he gave it to me after he went to um where, where, where are they antarctica so when he came back from a trip there i went to translate for him once and uh, everyone got some gifts and i got a penguin so anyway there's the penguin a uh, very blessed penguin so well let's start today as last time as before with a meditation so all of us here together of course no although not in the same place in different places but um we do the meditation together just a few moments of breathing which allows us to let go of whatever happened throughout the week today whatever thoughts of the past of the future we have to just be in the moment to just be present here with the Heart Sutra. Be aware of everyone else who's listening, um, but mainly to be able to focus. So let's just take a few moments of breathing and then share, you could pose the prayer. We'll do the prayer together again, the same as before, um, reminding ourselves that we are trusting ourselves in Buddhist psychology, that is the Dharma, of course, the person teaching it, the Buddha, as well as the Sangha. And we then generate together 
bodhicitta, the wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And then thereafter, to prepare ourselves for the activities of someone working towards the benefit of all sentient beings, having wished for enlightenment, we then generate that as we uh, recite together the four measurables. Okay, so as before. Now let's start with a little bit of breathing, some breathing meditation. Okay, well then let's do the prayers together. Sure, if you could, yes, great. So let's read them together. And while reading, of course, please pay attention to the meaning, which is more important than just than reading it. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And then the four immeasurables. Great, thank you. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Okay, lovely. So, like last time, what I'll do is I just briefly say a few things about what I said earlier on. It's more a uh, summary. Uh, then going over it again. And of course, today we'll actually talk about emptiness that is selflessness itself. But what of course is so important is to show how we can practice the sutra that is very short, very terse, um, but nonetheless is recited every day and holds such great significance because it contains so much. So every word has a meaning. Well, every word of course has meaning, but uh, in a sense that certain words that we may just read through quickly 
um, actually tell us things that we may not be aware of right away. So when you read the sutra, of course, it starts with the name. And as I said before, if you may not read the name, but well, if we decide to do then to hear, of course, hear that this sutra deals with wisdom, with the perfection of wisdom, with this great form of wisdom. And again, based on the understanding that all our trouble comes from not knowing how things really exist. Therefore, wisdom, of course, is so important. And the wisdom we're talking about here, we actually already have within us. We have this wisdom already, but we're unable to make it manifest. We are unable to bring it forth. So just the title is meant to inspire us. And then there's the homage by the translators, which is in many versions, it's not there, but to just spend a moment to remember the translators, of course, who've given us great service translating this text and many other texts. So the translator, translators translated the text from Sanskrit into Tibetan, but also, of course, in this case, uh, Venerable George Churinov translating the text from Tibetan into English. And then the text starts, the actual sutra starts <coughs> with a common prologue, the common explanation of the background of the sutra. And here, what we find out is that well, what we do, what we should do at this moment is visualize to be in that place, to be in the presence of the Buddha, of these great beings. So to visualize we're in this excellent place. I mentioned it last time, it's a Rajkriya, and that was seen as a place very conducive for practice. At an excellent time, of course, excellent time, because it was the time of the Buddha when the Buddha was around, and even in the presence, being in the presence of the Buddha with an excellent audience, great community of monks and nuns and uh, Shravakas, liberated beings, and of course, a great community of bodhisattvas being there together. So as I said last time in the commentaries, it, it mentions that the word together indicates that very harmoniously they were there together. Quite important. So this forms the Sangha and we're all aware of the Sangha. And oftentimes in, in, in the spiritual, places we're at, well, we may not, things may not be as harmonious. And so it's important to be together uh, in harmony, to get along with one another. And then talking about the Bhagavan here, the Buddha, he was dwelling, he was in that place called Mass of Vultures Mountain. So I haven't really, I haven't got let gone, I, I didn't get go of this name, Mass of Vultures Mountain because in the commentaries, they give different explanations. So remember I talked about many bodhisattvas manifested in the form of vultures, and I wasn't too happy about it, but I thought about it again. And there's something, I, I sent you a reading list uh, of different commentaries, English commentaries on the, on the Heart Sutra. And one of them is by Geshe Sonam Brinchen. And he just briefly mentions the bodhisattvas manifesting showing up in the form of vultures. Now, it's a little difficult to visualize that someone can actually willingly appear as this, that, and the other. Um, hopefully with selflessness, the more we talk about it, it makes more sense that of course the body we have is a result of our mind. We have this body because of our mind. And if we can learn to control our mind and if we have the same ability as a bodhisattva, well, at some point we'll be able to manifest in whichever way is most beneficial. And in this way, it's said that one reason why it's called Mass of Vultures Mountain, that many bodhisattvas manifested in the form of vultures. Um, and I was like, Geshe Sonomishin, well, what he said was, well, they didn't care about being attractive and wonderful. They just came up, came forth as these vultures, as these weird, birds that we usually think of as disgusting and dirty. Um, so based on that, I thought, well, I'll look at some qualities. What are these vultures anyway? What do vultures do? And I found this really interesting article that vultures are actually very important animals. So they're usually very underappreciated. There are not many poems, beautiful praises to vultures, uh, to hawks and, and eagles and nightingales, nightingales and so forth. So you find these, but they're usually not very popular animal, but they help to clean up diseases in the environment without passing on the diseases to others. 
So very interesting because a bodhisattva is someone who helps others to remove their obstructions, their obscurations, being unattacked, being unaffected by the negative attitudes of other sentient beings, but benefiting them. Um, at the same time, they can detect a carcass, a dead body, even before it decomposes. So as bodhisattvas, even before it's obvious to us, they they are aware of sentient beings suffering about their problems that we, we may not be aware of at the outside. The other person may be happy, may be content, but a bodhisattva is aware of all the problems other sentient beings have and of course are drawn towards them to benefit them. So again, similar. And then apparently their digestive system is highly acidic and they defecate while they eat the carcass and this highly acidic whatever uh, material cleanses their own body, but also the environment. So again, cleanses in the sense it gets rid of diseases, bacteria and other uh, living organisms that could potentially harm others. And in the same article, it was quite interesting. It, it talked about India some years ago had a huge problem because they fed a lot of uh, chemicals to animals like veterinary medicine. And when these animals died, a lot of the vultures died. And as a result of that, rabies took over in India and a lot of people died of rabies. And it took the Indian government $34 million billion to take care of the problem. So vultures are actually really important in India. And uh, so I thought, well, it makes sense that they, uh, bodhisattvas would possibly have um, manifested in the form of these very important, underappreciated uh, bats. Anyway, I, I just still thought there must be a reason for mentioning these vultures. So that's just the common prologue, talking about where it takes place, when it took place, who was present. So for us to visualize, we are in that same place. And then comes the uncommon prologue. Well, the Buddha sitting there, practicing the Buddha while well, sitting there not practicing but meditating being in the meditative state without saying much without saying much at all in the beginning not saying anything but just the silent presence of the dharmakaya of the well the mind the pure mind of a Buddha meditating on all phenomena ultimate as well as conventional and inspiring everyone there so again, I don't know whether I'm stretching it too far, but possibly the idea a teacher doesn't have to be someone who always talks to us and we can communicate with them. It's just their presence. Often it's just their presence that we can connect to that can inspire us uh, to practice. And then of course, there's Avalokiteshvara, so disciples of the Buddha, who also meditating while practicing. Of course, the Buddha no longer practicing, having reached the highest state possible, but his disciples practicing, such as Avalokiteshvara, the great Bodhisattva, practicing the perfection of wisdom. So here practicing means getting to understand what this wisdom refers to, what is its object, thinking about it, and of course, internalizing, mem uh, meditating on it. And then Shariputra's question. So what does Shariputra ask about? He asks about wisdom. So Shariputra being associated with the Pali tradition while Avalokiteshvara, the great Bodhisattva being associated with the Sanskrit tradition or to use the words Hinayana, Mahayana. Um, so being associated with these systems but there being no contradiction in the sense that nowadays people don't really practice together if they're from the different traditions because of course, Buddhism has gone to different countries. To some countries, there's more the Pali tradition. The Pali tradition is prevalent in other countries, the Sanskrit tradition, and there's not that much um, interaction. But at the time of the Buddha, there was. And of course, you can't have the, the Sanskrit tradition without the Pali tradition. So it's the foundation for, all, every, for every practice, for every Mahayana or for every uh, Sanskrit tradition practice. And also here the Chariputra asked this question because of course Chariputra himself at some point will become fully enlightened. Although right now uh, he manifests, he's, he's a, a Shravaka, he's a, um, he's a hero or a, a, an Arhat who followed the hero path. 
another debate that I haven't mentioned before. There's a debate in the very beginning when it says, thus have I once heard. Well, how does it, thus did I hear it one time. Yeah, so these words, who spoke these words? There's some debate among um, the different Indian masters. There's someone called Baba Vivika. He said, no way Ananda said this. Ananda was a hero past, a Shravaka, uh, well, not a, uh, he was a, he was a, a, a Pali, he was a Hinayana practitioner, he was a practitioner of the Pali tradition, why would he remember a Mahayana Sutra, why, he, he probably didn't understand it, and why would he pass it on, it must have been one of the Bodhisattvas, such as Manjushri, one of the Bodhisattvas who were around the Buddha, I'm not talking about the Buddha of, Buddha of wisdom here, but the actual person, Manjushri, a disciple, a Bodhisattva disciple of the Buddha who recorded this sutra. But then after Bhavya Viveka, there was a great person called Haribhadra. He was instrumental, his commentary was instrumental in bringing, well, no, his commentary is used in Tibet, is used in Tibet as one of the main commentaries on the Perfectional Wisdom Sutras. So he's instrumental in the Perfectional Wisdom Sutras being still studied and understood in, in the Tibetan, in Tibetan society nowadays. Now, Haibhadra said, oh no, Ananda could have understood this perfectly. Why not? He could have understood the meaning through the blessing of the Buddha, through the inspiration of the Buddha, and he could have passed it on. And that also makes sense to me because when we study Madhyamika, when we study, um, well, about emptiness, about the ultimate nature of all phenomena, in the beginning of our text, it talks about the meaning of a shravaka person, a hero. So in English, usually the word that is used is hero. And then an alternative word is a shravaka, which is the Sanskrit word. Now in Tibetan, there are actually two words. One word is hero, a person who listens and hears. That's the Tibetan meaning. And the other one is tutro in Tibetan, which means a person who hears and passes it on. So a shravaka, a shravaka literally means a person who passes on what he or she has heard. And it can even be a teaching on the Mahayana that they listen to Mahayana teachings, maybe themselves not practicing them, but passing them on to others, teaching them to bodhisattvas. So even followers of the Pali tradition, at the time of the Buddha, they would listen to the Buddha, understand the Mahayana teachings the Buddha gave and pass them on to bodhisattvas without themselves practicing to the same degree, but they had full understanding and compassion for those bodhisattvas, realizing that's what they needed to hear and they passed it on. So why not have Ananda act in such a way, listen to the teachings, understand them, passing them on, even though he was not possibly interested in the Mahayana teachings. Well, according to the, the according to the way it's explained, he was a, a Hinayana practitioner, a practitioner of the Pali tradition. Anyway, so what is the question that Shariputra asks? He asks about a person that is um, a son, mentions only a, a male, male practitioner, a, a person, a, a son of the lineage, a person who has generated great compassion. How should such a person practice? So this, on top of the fact that a bodhisattva is present, and of course also everything else that is taught later on. But on top of that, it shows that this is a Mahayana teaching because it mentions great compassion. Great compassion is that which comes before a bodhicitta. It is a mind that not only does it wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, from all limited states from all limited situations from all limitations altogether but it wishes may i be able to bring this about as a very important important mind which then later on develops into bodhicitta and of course compassion especially at this day and age so important in these very difficult times for so many different reasons. I mentioned them last time. I talked about the fact that right now we are basically sharing something with everyone else in this world. I mean, well, we share a lot of things with other people in general, of course, but at this point, the fear of the disease, the, the lockdown and all that, well, we can know for sure that we are right now in a very similar situation, whether you're in India, whether you're here, and actually, 
our situation is so much better than that of others. And as a very simple way to counteract fear and, and holding on to our problems right now is just to take a newspaper, go online and think about these problems. Well, inform yourself about all these difficulties, greater difficulties other people undergo and put yourself into the shoes of these people. And before long, if you put yourself into their shoes, the automatic reaction that we have when we think about our own problems is may I be free from those problems? Well, automatically the thought will arise, may they be free from these problems? And that's compassion. So when we identify problems of, of us, when we identify our own problems, of course the wish arises, may these problems go. But if we identify the problems of other people, well, this thought will usually also arise the more we put ourselves into their shoes. So it's just a tendency of our mind if we really put ourselves into another person's situation, understand what they're going through, then it's quite easy to think, relatively easy to think, may they be free from this problem. And that is a great antidote to dealing with our own problems. And it may even take us that, take us as far as doing something about it. But as His Holiness the Dalai Lama says in some of his books, he says, compassion actually we have a feeling it doesn't benefit us, it, more, it benefits more others, but it directly benefits us and only indirectly others, of course, if we react to it. So it's definitely a great means to deal with this situation right now, but on a larger scale, not just from the point of view of just now, here and right now, it's, a, it's, it's an important mind, it's a mind that uh, if it's missing, no way can we become bodhisattvas. And so therefore, it's important to practice great compassion. And great compassion can be easily misunderstood. It's so often that people ask, well, I got my own problems. I got my own difficulties, my own worries. So if I start looking at others' worries, at other people's problems, things just get worse. I'll be so depressed about what's going on with others, how can I carry their load if I can't carry my own? And in response to that, usually, well, I, I, I can think of one of my teacher's response to, to such a doubt when he said, that is a total misunderstanding of compassion. Compassion is not about being depressed and being pulled down by the suffering of others, but it's a, it's a type of courage, it's a type of determination becoming aware of the suffering of others and generating the determination, I need to do something or the wish to do something to bring forth courage within us. And this is also sometimes how anger can be misunderstood when we, when we think that being compassionate, being free from anger means anyone can just do anything to us. Any injustice would be all right because we're compassionate and we just allow everyone to walk over us and over other people. That's a total misunderstanding because the misbehavior, the, the negative actions of other people should lead to outrage. Outrage is probably a better word than anger. It's not really, it's not anger as such. It's just, it's not okay. That should not be done. This person is harming themselves and others and lead to the determination to do something about it. So. Compassion is not a passive type of mind, but it's a very courageous, a very powerful mind that gives us a lot of strength, much more strength than anger can give us. Anger exhausts us. Being angry for an hour, we're exhausted. So here, compassion is a type of determination. This is not okay. It's outrage with what's going on. It's not okay that people suffer, that sentient beings suffer. I myself need to do something. So that's the type of attitude. But just having that attitude, of course, is not enough. We need wisdom. If we have the wish to help others, to be of greater benefit, to be a good example to, us, to others, so in whichever way we want to help, of course, being a good example is the first step, but also to go out of our way when help is needed, even if it's just on a small scale, but to do as much as we can. Of course, that can only be done if we have wisdom, if we have a correct understanding, not just with regard to what is the right thing to do, how can I help, but also with regard to the more underlying ideas. How do I exist? How do others exist? 
to be able to deal with my own problems, first of all, because I'm, if I'm totally overwhelmed by my own problems, there's very little I can do. Which takes me, of course, to, well, starting with ourselves. I've mentioned it last time. It's mentioned again. It's, well, it's, it's explained in so many different texts. First of all, we need to start loving ourselves, having compassion and acceptance and tolerance for ourselves before we can develop it for other being patient with ourselves being patient with our own uh, shortcomings understanding that we can make changes of course and in that way with this acceptance and tolerance we are much more willing to look at our own mind get to know our own mind generate that sense of curiosity and possibly a sense of humor that we can love about our funny monkey mind but not just that we, if we want to bring happiness to others, if we want to bring more, and what is happiness? I'm not talking about enjoyment, happiness, but satisfaction, a sense of satisfaction, of well-being. It's important to feel well and satisfied ourselves. So we can only be strong enough if we have that kind of sense of satisfaction and well-being. So some time ago, I was told that in Israel, and it's not just in Israel, I'm pretty sure it's in other countries, but it was a real eye opener that sometimes people feel guilty to be happy because of the situation around them, because of the situation other people are in. So feeling I don't deserve to be happy. And from a Buddhist psychological point of view, well, that's a huge mistake, a huge mistake. Of course, if you can't bring about your own happiness, well, then we need to work on this as a pro progress it takes time but if you deny yourself happiness although you could have it because of feeling guilty well then i usually say well you have a personal responsibility to live this happiness to be a happy and content person because we can only bring happiness and contentment if we have if we feel it ourselves we'll be calmer we have more energy we're more able to be loving and compassionate so therefore personal well-being is extremely important physical as well as uh, mental but then returning to the heart sutra now being in this situation so where are we we are right now at rajkriya in this incredible place with the buddha shariputra avalokiteshvara and shariputra has just asked this question it's just ask avalokiteshvara how should a son of a lineage, someone who has this great compassion, who has generated the wish to benefit others, or the, the, who has the wish to benefit others, um, how should such a person practice? Okay, let me just look at my own text. So how should such a person practice? And this, this question is asked through the inspiration of the Buddha, through the power of the Buddha. Now, the word power in English, it's almost like the Buddha is kind of like, it's got like some kind of like a Harry Potter style of like just uh, getting the 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 the, the Shai Puta to talk, but I think it's a lot more. It's it's got more of the sense of yeah, maybe through that power, but also um, it has the sense of being inspired through the blessing of the Buddha, the inspiration of the Buddha. So how should a son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? Activity. Why activity? Well, wisdom does something. Wisdom is not a static entity that just knows something but it actually it actively tries to understand initially well in the development here the practice means the development of wisdom the, the causes the, the the time of the cost causing that wisdom that we're aiming for so basically developing manifesting the wisdom we have inside us by generating the right causes and conditions so in other words is to practice it become familiar with it and to develop it further and that's an activity that's a process a process that's a good word it's a process that takes time so there's no quick fix as many of you know a few times meditating is not enough um and also well then in response to this this is what Avalokiteshvara, so that's what Shariputra says so then the Bodhisattva the Mahasattva Avalokiteshvara I Avalokiteshvara he then answers he then answers to he gives an answer to Shariputra he's here described as the bodhisattva because wishing to benefit 
wishing to become a Buddha, wishing to become an enlightened being, a Mahasattva, because doing, doing this for the benefit of others, and an Arya, because Avalokiteshvara has understood the ultimate nature of phenomena directly, has experienced, experienced it directly himself, and therefore is the perfect candidate to pass it on to others, which he does here. So he responds, Shariputra, any son or any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage. So any son or daughter of the lineage, emphasizing, and I said that last time I mentioned that in some copies, in some versions of the Heart Sutra in Tibetan, it does actually say right from the beginning, even as part of the question that Shariputra asks, it says already any son or daughter of the lineage. But the most common Tibetan version that is usually recited, well, at least the one I'm familiar with that you find in prayer books, for instance, is the one where Shariputra only asks about son of the lineage and then Shai, and Avalokiteshvara then saying son and daughter, which I think is important because it stresses the fact that whether male or female, it doesn't matter whether you're from this country or that country, tall or short or whatever, the differences are between us, even whether we're an animal or a human, well, we all have the ability eventually to generate the wisdom described here and of course to become fully awakened. But here, of course, in more, more specifically, he talks about human beings, um, any son or daughter or anything, any, any, well, I guess nowadays you would say anyone who's neither male or female, etc anyone any human definitely has this ability so who wishes to practice this activity who wishes to become active when it comes to the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it in the following way so correctly correctly means we need to correctly understand what is explained here and repeatedly repeatedly now this is what's so important because when teaching this when teaching this, we're all putting on, I put on the philosopher's head and you are putting on the philosopher's head. You're in a situation listening to philosophy and it's great. You'll understand possibly what is said. If you have some background, you understand better. Every time you hear about it, you understand something. So we're all in this kind of mode of being philosophers. But, and that's of course important because in order to, actually internalize this, bring this into our daily life, we need to first gain an understanding of what this means, what this is talking about. But it should not just remain at that. And that's the hardest part, of course, to take whatever we learn and bring it into our daily life. So to whatever you hear tonight about what the Buddha has taught about emptiness and so forth, how is this relevant to my own personal life? tomorrow well maybe even tonight what happens tonight what happens tomorrow morning how is this relevant to me how does this in any way affect me can affect me how is this relevant in my interaction with others is there anything i learn here that helps me to deal with my interaction with other people to deal with stress to deal with my self-doubts and so forth so this is where you take buddhism from that what you call it abstract idea it's kind of like sometimes talking about emptiness thinking about emptiness it's like thinking about a mathematical problem which seems to be totally removed there's like the numbers over there and there's real life over here but of course it's not like that none of what we discuss exists in any way remotely from our daily life it's totally relevant so that kind of transition i think is one of the, the most difficult points it's the hardest. Why, and I've also said that many times, many of you have heard me say that many times, our mind has many different levels. There is the intellectual type of mind that we all have. We're very good at it. Understanding difficult problems, understanding complicated issues, finding a problem to them. But very often that type of mind is quite superficial. It's quite superficial in the sense it doesn't necessarily, it can of course, but it doesn't necessarily affect us on an emotional level. Classic example is, 
I know intellectually I could die tomorrow. But on an emotional level, no, I'm too busy. I won't die tomorrow. I'm too busy. I got the whole week planned. I won't die tomorrow. So if you engage in mindfulness, mindfulness of your own mind, to watch your own mind, which meets introspection, a certain degree of attentiveness, and recollection to um, again and again remember what am I trying to focus on? Not to get totally carried away by external objects, but to focus on my own mind. You come to see that there is this gap. Yes, I know that. You know a lot of things. We know a lot of things. But when it comes down to challenges in life, when difficulties arise, we respond with a more emotional mind. And whatever knowledge we have of impermanence, of the self doesn't exist that way, things are not as, things will change. They will not remain the same. There is no self that is personally affected, etc. All this is gone. All this is gone. And on an emotional level, the usual habit this thought arises, the next thought arises, the next, and before long, we have an argument, we get unhappy, the other person gets unhappy, and we're back to this emotional kind of response that we're so used to. So we don't break through our emotional response that we're so used to. Now, if we practice what is set in the Heart Sutra, first is just this intellectual level, but through repeated, and this is the word here, repeatedly thinking about it, reflecting on it again and again, that mind automatically goes deeper, goes to a deeper level, to a more habitual level, which on that level, you find your own emotions. They're very much based on our habitual mind. And so then, slowly through repeated, through repeated habituation, which many of you may be aware, the Tibetan word for meditation means in fact habituation habituating ourselves over and over and over again. And what I find very interesting is that when it comes to wisdom, there are always quite a few people saying, yeah, well, I like the aspect of Buddhism where it's just about watching the mind and love, compassion. Yeah, that's my cup of tea. But the whole intellectual part, I'm just not an intellectual person. I know about this because that's how I felt. That's how I felt. When I first came to Buddhism, I thought, oh, I was terrible at math. I'm not a logical person. I'm an emotional, I'm much more of an artsy fartsy kind of person. Um, I'm not, right? But that was a, the biggest obstacle to initially putting my head around it because this is something anyone can understand. It is not that difficult. I mean, if we manage to go through 13 years of school, I'm pretty sure, and through whatever difficult mathematical, scientific kind of classes, we can manage emptiness. The only reason we don't is because we don't spend enough time with it. We spend time, again, we read articles about politics, etc. If we spend the same time on Madhyamika, it wouldn't take us that long. And there's a lot of material available now. But also bring it into our daily life. How is this relevant? How is this relevant? And so forth. So... This is what I want to encourage you to make this part of your daily routine, to bring this into your daily life. So what does Avalokiteshvara mean when he says the five aggregates are also empty of inherent existence? Also, he says also, like I said, many of these words are very relevant. They mean something very specific. The word also here means they are also empty of inherent existence, just as the person is, just as the self is. So he's kind of saying, well, the self doesn't exist the way it appears. And the same is true for mind and body. The five aggregates is just another way of saying that which makes me a person, this psychophysical entity, mind and body. So it actually starts off with the self, the I, so important. The I is so important. To some people it may seem like, well, I thought Buddhism is all about removing the I and being less selfish. And then we're talking about the I all the time. But of course, it's about lessening the I, understanding the I in order to reduce our self-centeredness, our habitual tendency to put our happiness before the happiness of others. 
And one of my teachers once so beautifully said it. He said, it's amazing how we allow ourselves to be under the control of the eye. We are slaves to our eye. The word slave, I wouldn't use the word servant because a servant gets some salary, but we don't even get a salary. So our self-centered mind is, is ever present keeps telling us, I want this, I don't want that. Now I want some coffee. Now I want a good meal. Now I want to get my job back. I want to get outside. I want this corona to go. I want this, I want that. I don't want my neighbors to have a better car than myself, etc. Whatever the I wants. And so there's this thought at first, and not every thought is that kind of thought. Okay, there are thoughts when you're with a friend the friend has a problem you're just with the problem you're listening to it you're finding a solution that is not a selfish mind that is in fact a mind that acts upon compassion but every now and then when it's threatened when in any way something that we're familiar with that we believe can give us lasting happiness when that's threatened whoa, we're very strong there I, the mind my happiness my well-being so that type of mind then makes us do things. It makes us get out of our way to possibly cheat, etc. But not even that. I mean, like even morning to evening, it's there. It's like this silent presence. And every now and then it pops up. The more hungry we get, the more, oh, I need food, etc. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that. But we're following blindly after that eye without ever checking what is the eye. I need this my well-being, my reputation. In fact, there's a sense of having to protect this I. We feel very vulnerable. When we're with other people, feeling possibly shy and feeling people we don't know, there's a sense we need to protect this I. And when people criticize us, we need to protect our reputation. When someone tries to take away things from us, we need to protect my 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 what's it called my possessions that that which is mine so my reputation my success so saying mine well what is the i that owns what is that self all right so this is what avalokiteshvara is talking about is he saying that i doesn't exist at all it's simply on there is no inherently existent well aggregate when he says there's no i know you know no inherent there's no in happiness of what else say exists. And of course, these things do don't exist, but here we're not talking about non-existences, but not in the way we believe them to exist. We seem to have as a solidity an ex well, the difficulty of understanding what Avalokiteshvara is talking about here. But what is that characteristic existing inherently, for instance, doesn't exist. While at the same time saying that we start off with the self. Here, Sharputra, well, no, have a look at Tashman because our lives revolve around our eyes, the job of my eye. We, we express it differently. The children of my eye. The job owns reputation, that owns children, that owns, well, in mine, there's this possessor. That eye revolves around your eye. My life revolves around my eye. Does it appear to me, first of all, how does it, it's to my mind, the way it appears, the way it presents itself, it's itself to my mind. I perceive it in a certain way. I don't like this. How does this I present itself? I'm aware of that. But the explanation, and here again, mindfulness, mindfulness, not just of our own mind, but also of how it perceives the different objects. Okay, so the Buddha, Avalokiteshvara, they just explain what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking of, well, when am I thinking I? How does this I present itself to me? And what we'll find, and here it's again an intellectual, is this true? Does the sense of I that is explained, the first thing we need to check, the first thing that, the, the, there are different levels, basically. So there are different levels how we can come to understand that this I are uh, kind of stepping stones that take us to, we're trying to understand here, but there is a way that other wrong perception that occur 
as a result of that misperception when it comes to inherent existence. So perceiving the I to exist inherently or independently or objectively, that's the root problem. But it gives rise to other misperceptions. One of them is we perceive the I to be permanent. We perceive the I to be more solid than it actually is, which leads to a perception of a permanent I. Now, if our I is defined by mind and body, well, mind and body are changing all the time. How could there be an I that is the same? And if you think back, the I, your I when you were five years old, the I that you had when you were 10, the I you had when you were 15, uh, and then you just go up five years, five years. Five years are good because we definitely notice the difference between five years. So when I was five, when I was 10, when I was 15, when I was 20, I don't know how many 20 year old ones are present there right now. Uh, but anyway, so you go from there. Is there a sense you've changed? Oh, absolutely. I don't think of myself as being the same I when I was five years old or even 10 or 15 and so forth. But is there a sense that the I right now, your I, your sense of a self, me here, there's, there's me here and you're there. Me here is the same I, a sense, I'm saying a more emotional sense, not an intellectual sense. The intellectual is out, like your intellectual mind tells you lots of things and it's great. I mean, you've, you've learned by now that, of course, intellectually seen, I, I myself is changing, but on an emotional level, does it seem the I is the same as yesterday? Does the same I, is that the same I that was yesterday, or the I that came into the room that you're sitting in right now? If you were hurt yesterday, if someone was rude to you, is there a sense, I'm still hurting, this eye is still hurting, it's still that same eye that was, I don't know, hurt, that was insulted, whatever. And of course, if the eye that feels that's hurting now, if it's a feeling that's the same that was there yesterday, well, then by definition, your I must be permanent because you have your I yesterday and your I now are the same, identical, they're the same, there's no change. So this means, therefore, we have an instinctive sense, and again, it's not always there, but every now and then we can catch ourselves having a sense that the I doesn't change. I make the same mistake. I'm the same idiot again and again. Oftentimes we have these thoughts um, and they arise from the sense that there is a solid I that is so solid that it doesn't change. The same sense we have with other people. I often give the example when we are still angry with a person for what they've done to us last week. There's a sense that's the same guy who harmed me. That's the same guy who insulted me. And again, if that is the same I, the same self, the same person there, well, they, they, they haven't changed. They're the same. So that is a misperception of the I, which if we catch it, it's relatively easy to go against it. Of course, we have to remind ourselves there's nothing permanent. Nothing, I mean, nothing means the, the eye or the mind and body, they're constantly changing. Just because we're not aware of the differences doesn't mean we don't change. So you may say, oh, I made the same mistake again. Well, yeah, there are similarities, but the situation is never exactly the same. The mistake is never exactly the same because all the circumstances are different. They're different. So there's similarities, but by definition, that which is similar is not the same. So there's a difference. This idea of impermanence is so incredibly helpful. And it's often underestimated. People are more interested in emptiness. That's difficult to understand. So yeah, in the impermanence, I understand that. That's fine. Yeah, move on, move on. I understand. Of course, yeah, if it's understood, no need to talk about it further. Now it's about applying it, applying it into our daily life. But you can tell when a person is applying impermanence or not. You can tell. You can tell by their reaction to positive or negative events. Negative events, if you're like, oh my, oh no, oh my, I'm so depressed. Oh my God, my life is over. 
oh, this huge problem. A problem, the moment it arises, it's already changing into something else. Any situation. I mean, think back three weeks ago, Corona, you now, it's not the same. You get used to it. Things are changing. People are getting better. The stores are, the stores are opening. Toilet paper is back on the shelves. Not everywhere, but, you know, there's hope. Anyway, so the point is things are changing. So there, if you cannot let go, if like a problem arises and you're holding on, oh, this is a problem, your mind automatically holds on to a permanent problem. You just caught your mind in the process of holding on, of suggesting this is lasting. And it's so hard to catch because this emotion is very strong so sometimes we're just aware of this negative emotion something happens we're upset we don't want this we don't have the space in our mind to go wait wait what what is my mind doing oh gosh i got you i got the mind i just caught this mind that's holding on to permanence so this is where all this is relevant it's not on the meditation cushion you're getting ready you're like a emergency doctor right when everything is calm you know there's no emergency no one is bleeding to death so you're going through all the motions on your meditation cushion until an emergency arises what is the emergency a fight with a neighbor a strong emotional problem someone who who you who you're very close to who abuses you insults you says something and whoa there's this pain now now you're like this what do you call it? Emergency doctor, for lack of a better word. I don't know the word right now. But the person who's like, there's an emergency. Someone's bleeding to death. There's just strong negative emotion. Let's look at it. This is the moment to do it. So this is your, what do you call it? Um, petri dish. That's your petri dish. If we want to understand our mind better, understand the self better. Whoops. There's the sun. If you want to know your mind better, the self better, well, you can do it best in the, in situations when there's strong emotional response, when, responses, when problems arise. So to then, well, maybe not in that moment, but even retrospectively, you can sit down and go, well, what happened? What was the situation? What my what was my response? And I guarantee you, you find grasping onto permanence. A sense the situation is permanent. I'm permanent, the other person is too. But that's just the coarser level. Then with regard to the self in particular, so not only does the I appear to be permanent, but also what it appears, what also appears is it seems to be in charge of mind and body. There is a solid I that controls mind and body. There's this I that when you hurt me, then not only are my feeling, my feelings are hurt, whatever that means, my feelings are hurt, my reputation is down the river, it's like down the drain, uh, but also I'm hurt. So because you possibly hit me with a stick, so my body hurts, but also the eye was hurt. So there's a separate eye that is now hurting because you hit me with a stick or you pushed against me or you used your corona hands on my shoulders or whatever, <laughs> whatever, right? So the point is here that, yeah, something happens to mind and body, and then there is a self, there's a sense of an I that's being hurt, a separate I. A separate I that is separate from mind and body that in fact controls mind and body. That is not talking about an inherent I yet. It's still talking about something a little coarser than that, easier to understand. So we have a wrong sense that the self is permanent, but we also have a sense that there is an I that's controlling everything. And again, I ask you to please get in touch with this. In particular, the expression I really like that really brings that home is I took it personally. Right. If someone, if someone just a crazy person is walking around and is, is screaming at you and someone else, we don't take it personal. 
we think, oh gosh, that poor guy, look, he's just going wild, screaming at me and others. So there is no sense, oh, this person wanted to hurt me. But when someone kind of explodes at you and you think, oh, they've done this to me and there's this hurt, this is when we've taken it personally. This, one, there's, this is when there's a sense, my eye was hurt. This eye was hurt. And that is the moment again, how was it hurt? Which eye was hurt? So to have the presence of mind to go, okay, there's this mind that's telling me I was hurt, but let's check, what is that mind? To really take a moment to check it. Okay, now that is a deeper level. That's even a deeper level. So in that, when, you, when you're dealing with that, you're not yet dealing with what's called inherent existence. But you're dealing with a sense of self that is not realistic. If that entity, which in a lot of cultures is, there's a whole picture built around it. There's a whole philosophy built around it. In some cultures, they may call it the soul. And of course, in every culture, the soul means something different. Or the ego, or the super ego, or whatever. There's a whole philosophy based on that. But the Buddha, what the Buddha said was in the sutra, that's not there. There's such a self doesn't exist. There is not such a self. Okay. And how can we find out? Well, to look for it. If it's there, we should find it. If it's there, we should find it. And of course, here I'm not talking about a conventional eye. There's, of course, an eye that does exist, but this solid eye that presents itself to my mind when I'm thinking I was hurt. And it's not always there. That sense of an eye is not always there. Sometimes we're with other people and there's no sense this is this person, this is me, and this is them. This divide is just not there. We just are. Okay, so we have these moments, but there's no separation. The sense of a solid eye. It also creates separation. I'm here and you're there. It is very strongly there when you feel lonely, even in the presence of many people. There's them and I'm here and I'm separate from them. That's just a creation of the mind, a solid I here. And the way to go about it is to look for it. You, you look for it within meditation. So how to do it? As part of the Heart Sutra, if you use this as a meditation, is first of all, go through the steps that I earlier explained, put your mind into that calm state of feeling inspired, of having gratitude, being inspired, being in the presence of these great beings, of this, these inspiring, well, Shravakas, that is hero practitioners, Hinayana practitioners, Mayana practitioners, Bodhisattvas, and so forth, feeling, being inspired by their example. And then, so if I want to be more compassionate, you may even take it to the step, you generate compassion for all sentient beings. You go through a meditation, and we can do it together in a moment. Generate compassion for all sentient beings, and then take a moment, well, what is this person that's got compassion? What is that I? Here, in response, what does Avalokiteshvara say? Also, the aggregates don't exist inherently. Well. There is no inherent I either. There's no permanent I. There's no solid possessing I entity. And even deeper, there is no inherent I. There is nothing. When we talk about I, there's of course a conventional I, but there is no nothing within, within this I that makes it the I that exists in and of itself. Now, this is very hard to understand. This deepest level of how the eye doesn't exist. I mentioned the eye doesn't exist as a permanent entity. It doesn't exist as a solid owner of my problems, my mind, my body, my family, my citizenship, etc. That doesn't exist. But we can go even deeper. There's nothing intrinsic found here that I can call the I. And that is difficult to understand. That is so hard. And really the center, we just got to the, the, to the center, not the center, to the heart of the heart, heart sutra. I got to the essence of the heart sutra here. 
later on it's easier because having explained what this lack of inherent existence of not existing or being empty of existing in a certain way what that is we then apply it to other things we apply it to everything to become aware nothing can exist in the way it presents itself to our mind okay now going back to I'll say a little bit more to get a better understanding and I don't know whether I should race through it and just explain you the rest of the Heart Sutra or spend more time on emptiness. But my, my sense is without really getting a sense of it, and I'm not a good person to explain it. Um, there are great teachers, of course, you should get teachings from them, but maybe I can add a little bit to that with what I explained to you here. Of course, only based on what my incredible teachers have, have, explained, have explained to me. Um, so, one thing that comes to mind that I always find quite helpful is to look at these different characteristics that are here, that are denied here, that are that we say that I is empty of. We say inherent existence. That's one, one word that is used. Another word is that is used is saying the I doesn't exist independently. That is easier to understand. So we're now no longer talking about these coarser levels or these coarser characteristics we're denying, namely permanent I or a kind of solid controlling I. The expression is a self-sufficient, substantial I, substantially existent I. Without looking at those, those are easier understood. And well, maybe not after what I said today, but in general, they are. Let's look at inherent existence right away. So the Buddha says nothing exists inherently, neither the I nor anything else. But we think it does. We think that phenomena do exist that way. So there are different words that can be used. Things seem to exist from their own side in and of themselves, independently, inherently, by way of their own characteristics, objectively. Wow, what does that mean? What does that mean? So inherent existence is the, the word that is used mostly. Now, I'm pretty sure you have a word for inherent in Hebrew. It is actually not a word that is used much in the English language. It's not in, in colloquial, you don't say so much, oh, it's inherent in this water to be wet. N not many people use it. It's natural for water to be wet. So therefore, sometimes people use the word naturally existent. The eye doesn't exist naturally. But that's a little odd. That's a little weird because people get confused about this term, but it has that meaning. Now, one example, and some of you have heard me in my last visit to Israel, I've talked about it on different occasions, but I really like this example, which comes from one of my teachers, Gintub Tempesa. So he says, well, think of something that seems to be in and of itself naturally to be this, that, and the other. To take an example, the example he gave was water. If you think of water, is water naturally hot? Is water naturally hot? Yes or no? Is it naturally hot? No, it's not naturally hot, right? Water is not naturally hot. We would say it's not inherent in water to be hot. It's not inherent in water to be hot. Why not? It's very simple. It's not inherent in water to be hot. Why? Because in order to be hot, you need an external heating source to heat it up and make it hot. So it's not in and of itself. It's not just on its own. It, it, it just, it's not just hot, okay? Because you need something else to make it hot. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, then we could ask, is water naturally wet? Is it natural to water to be wet? And in answer to that, we would say yes. 
It's inherent in water. It's natural to water. It just is. It just is wet. Okay. In the same sense, we have a sense that water just is water. It just is water. You don't need anything. It just is. And why do I perceive it as water? Because it is water. That's how it feels. Right? So water is not naturally hot. Okay. It's not naturally cold either. It's not chilling cold either. No, because it needs some other circumstances to be that. All right. So it's not inherent in water to be hot, but it's inherent in water to be wet. Okay. So here we're already moving closer to the sense. It's there's something with, it comes from water itself. It comes from water itself to be hot. To, sorry, <laughs> to be wet, not hot. If there's something, you don't need anything else. It just is wet. It just is wet. Okay. So here we're already moving closer to the actual meaning. Now, also with regard to water, why is it water? Well, it, it, it just is, it just is water. It just is and you don't need anything. And the reason I perceive it as water is because it is water from its own sight. From its own sight means it's wet from its own sight. It doesn't need, it doesn't need like a heating device that not, that besides heating it up, also makes it wet, right? It just is. Now, this is what Buddhism is, this is what the Buddha is denying. He's saying water is actually not inherently wet because you need something other than water to make it wet. You need something other to make it wet. You need hydrogen. You need oxygen. That's not water. Oxygen is not water. Hydrogen is not water. What else do you need? You need someone to perceive it as wet, right? Wetness. Wetness is experienced by our skin, okay? What is wetness? How about fire? Is, is it natural to fire to be hot? Well, if it was within the fire, it didn't depend on oxygen to be hot. It didn't depend on, for instance, skin or any material to be heated, to, be, to, be, to, be, to get warmer because of it, right? If everything remains the same temperature when getting in touch with fires, speak, in other words, the, the temperature doesn't go up, how could you say fire is hot? It's because I experience it as hot. So it's a dependence on the experience of heat that we can say it is hot. And anyway, everyone experiences a certain temperature differently to one person, a specific, specific temperature is hot to the another person, it's not. If heat, was inherent in 22 degree, okay? If 22 degree were hot, well, you wouldn't see any Indians when it's 22 degrees wearing down jackets and Germans putting on their shirts and, and sun lotion, right? Depending on the, I'm talking about different people here being more used to cold or being more used to heat. So actually, if you talk about an environment of 22 degree, is it inherent for that environment to be hot? No, it just depends on how it's perceived. It depends on many other aspects. Is it inherent in water to be wet? No, it depends on many other things that are not water that make it wet. Is it inherent to, for water to be water? No, it needs a mind to be perceived to be water. If there wasn't a mind to perceive it, there wouldn't be any water. So it's not in, intrinsic. It's, there's nothing that can be found within water that makes it water, just independently. It is water, but in dependence on many, many, many different factors and definitely a mind perceiving it as water. But that's not how it seems. That's not how it seems. It seems to us when we look around, when we live in this world on a daily basis, we look around, things seem to be this, that, and the other. And we perceive them this, that, and the other because that's what they are. That's it. It just seems everything around us, right? Everything around us, we don't realize at the least it needs our own mind 
to perceive it that way. No, we don't realize that. It seems it just is that already. And we just come, we just happen to be there to see it. All right, okay. Time is up again. I haven't done a meditation yet. So maybe we could do a meditation together here. Um, again. Okay, right now I got this. All right, so to do a meditation together, let me just close the shade. Oops, I lost the penguin. Okay. So to do meditation on this together, but of course in the context of the Heart Sutra, doing that, we, I just lead you through it, lead you through it first to visualize you're in that place, being inspired by these great beings, but then to also look at the eye, watch the eye, okay? And I ask you to get in touch with that permanent eye and to just question that, is that possible? And a sense of an owner or a controller eye, etc. So just to kind of lead you gently through a meditation, we don't have much time, um, but we do it together. And the reason I'm doing it together now is for you to do it on your own. And you come up with a lot of own reasons if you have some background anyway. Uh, but whatever, I want you to be creative when you're on your own to do this reflection. But of course here, um, yeah, we'll, we'll do it together. We practice it together. So let's take a few moments of just breathing. Of just watching the breath, just a half a minute. We don't have that much time. So now as part of, or being part of the Heart Sutra here, visualize that you're in this special place. You're in India at the time of Purashakya Muni, surrounded by great practitioners, each one more inspirational than the other. with, of course, the presence of the great enlightened being himself. Who's silently absorbed in the wisdom experiencing reality. And so Shariputra has just asked this question with regard to how should we practice if we have generated compassion for all sentient beings? So let's take a short moment to allow this compassion to rise in our hearts for the welfare of all sentient beings. May all suffering sentient beings be free from their worries, their fears, their anger, their attachment, their envy. And may I myself bring this about. Just generate that thought in your mind.
So if I really want to be a benefit to other sentient beings, what I need is wisdom. Which is why Avalokiteshvara, inspired by the Buddha, is teaching us that the I does not exist. The way it presents itself day in and day out. So if you can, get in touch with your own personal sense of I. Maybe there's a moment in time you remember when there was a very strong sense, I was hurt. I was treated unjustly. Or I'm special. I that we try to protect, get a sense of that I. The I that has children, that owns things. Is there a sense that it's constant and static, non-changing? Is there a sense that it owns mind and body, it controls mind and body. Well, if it was really there, if there was such a controller, such a owner of mind and body. We should be able to find it. We should be able to remove mind and body and be left with this controller I. Is there any entity within you that is intrinsic? Or on its own? That which we can call the I. Or is there rather a body with its different parts and different types of mind? Maybe 
based on which we designate I. In a way that when my legs move, I say I move. When my mind meditates, I think I meditate. Without the existence of a solid, independent I. An eye that keeps me busy. And a sense of constantly striving to satisfy its every need. Now to conclude this short meditation, just spend a few moments allowing your mind to absorb whatever sense of your own self you've developed. Just allow this to go a little deeper to sink onto an emotional level. I'm sorry for racing you through this meditation. Of course, it needs a lot more detail. But since I was asked to, to do a meditation like that, well, of course, this just gives you a taste and hopefully you have the time on your own to go over what we discussed with regard to how does the eye appear to me? How, do my, how does it appear to me as the owner of whatever I call mine? how to react in certain situations, and also the idea possibly of the water. Is it intrinsic in water? Is there something from the side of the object, within the object, I can find that I can call beautiful, that I can call ugly, etc. And we'll talk a lot more about the relativity of things uh, next time. So not just the sense of something being within the object, but also their relativity. Okay but time is up. This time we didn't have time for questions, but maybe we'll continue the way we did it last time. I think throughout the week, there was no question before we had two. So if there's anyone who has a question, you're welcome to post it. Um, and uh, I'll try and answer it. But again, for next time, please, if you can, again, continue daily reading the, the Heart Sutra. And now, whatever you've learned today, and of course, if you have the time, read the different commentaries by His Holiness, an amazing commentary by Geshe Sonam Rinchen. They uh, tell you so much more about this sutra. So enabling you to make the most out of it when you repeat it, but of course, also do the meditations. 
um, in particular with regard to the eye. There's no permanent eye, there's no controlling eye, and there's nothing intrinsic. So whatever understanding you have reached, however limited it is, please apply that. And then when challenges arise and you, 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 you find yourself upset, stressed out, emotionally in a, in a like an emotional turmoil this is the time to go oh wait a minute there was something and if not right in that moment to go back to that situation and try to see whether anything you've learned could possibly help you to deal with this better okay great um it's time is up let's do the dedication together sure can you bring it up on the screen okay great all right so again, as we did before, the prayer, of course, you should think of its words and really internalize it. But of course, before that, also think that whatever positive potential we have accumulated uh, as this group being linked, although in an unusual way, but all of us here together, reflecting upon the words of the Buddha, meditating on them, may that become the cause for us to remove whatever's in the way, to manifest our own wisdom, our own understanding, to generate more love and compassion for other sentient beings, and eventually to remove all our obscurations to attain the awakened state of a Buddha. So we are of greatest benefit to ourselves, but also to all sentient beings. So with this in mind, let's read this together. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue, by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the hopeless find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all the medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and the people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, thank you very much for coming together, for having interest in this amazing sutra, um, having interest in learning about it, meditating on it. Um, and I wish you a very fruitful and, and happy uh, worry-free week and maybe see you again next Sunday. Okay, shalom. Mm-hmm. <laughs>